I would like to welcome you all for having uh, come here this morning and uh, tomorrow to hear uh, teachings and transmission on great melody of experience uh, that His Eminence will be teaching. Um, the reason I am here this morning uh, is uh, not pre-planned, uh, but His Eminence, as you know, uh, is in constant meditation. And sometimes uh, that constancy of meditation um, and is uh, not interruptible by, by conventional times <laughs> that we, might, we may want him to do <laughs> the things. But uh, you, can, you can be reassured whether you are here um, or whether you are in presence of his eminence, uh, you are in the protective pavilion of his compassion and wisdom. Uh, he will be here shortly, uh, uh, but we will hear when that is going to be. <laughs> so uh, I'm here to fill in, <laughs> fill in, uh, um, to to uh, brief you with few important things that may be important for you to uh, fully uh, understand the teachings uh, that His Eminence have kindly agreed to give. That's the great melody of experience. <clears throat> this great melody of experience refers to the meditative realization of a profound uh, experience of one of the very pioneer great yogis of Tibet who came in early uh, 13th century and wrote his experience as a meditation, particularly that of the highest experience of special insight. And uh, so it is important to know uh, where does this great melody of experience fits in. Uh, some of the profound expressions, of course, uh, will speak in the language of a language that transcend ordinary convention, uh, uh, that transcendental wisdom, uh, often not easily understood by ordinary. So, it is very much an experience of meditation. I'm sure many of you are already doing some form of meditation, if not seeking to learn some practices. What makes Buddhist teaching so important is it is not based on theory alone, but is practice validated by personal experience. And uh, so experience of meditation, often uh, of great saints, have been expounded in a form of gathas or, or versified hymns and songs. In, in the early, early Indian uh, Buddhist tradition, of course, you, you'd hear about the sutras, or more of a dialogue between the Buddha and his disciple, or sometimes dialogues between two senior disciples of Buddha, Buddha himself presiding over the conversation, often, uh, often uh, sanctioning and endorsing the question and response, respondents' answers. And those were mainly sutras, or sutras mainly, mainly a collection of various, uh, I would say, miscellaneous but very pertinent points of the teachings that, that was uh, elucidated in conversations between a student and teacher, and whereby Buddha himself often uh, endorsed and, and uh, I would say, uh, and sanctioned. So those earliest form of Buddhist uh, teachings were the sutras. Sutras really means threads, threads of threads of ideas through which you weave the pattern of a path to enlightenment. Many threads of ideas that made coherent meaning uh, to the actual framework of the teachings of the Buddha. Teachings of Buddha itself only was later on, after his passing away, was codified in the name of the sutras. Abhidharma and uh, Vinaya, that what is known as three higher trainings. Buddha himself, I don't think, did not quite specifically theorize any of his teachings. They were all compilation of numerous conversations and teachings and dialogues and direct sermons given by the Buddha. And hence the word sutras mainly means all wonderful ideas of 
uh, prompted by uh, disciples and uh, fulfilled the wishes of the Christians uh, by the teacher and the senior disciples of the Buddha, uh, therefore were, re were remembered and recounted by elder members of the disciples of the Buddha who all have achieved through meditation what is called art of non-forgetfulness. Through the art of non-forgetfulness, every single conversation, phrases, and sentences that occurred in the teachings of the Buddha were recorded together. After passing away of the Buddha, all were classified. Those teachings that primarily dealt with the moral precepts to uh, a way of uh, invoking uh, self-discipline, uh, whether I was a monastic or lay, from whether full ordination or, or periodical, uh, I would say limited time ordination, uh, either as a lay or fully ordained monks or nuns, all the vows pertaining to guarding one's body, speech, mind, in a conduct that, uh, that not only became concordant to the uh, teachings of the Buddha, but also became concordant to the norms of the society in which Buddhism flourish. Vod Vinaya largely means subjugation. So teaching that primarily gave ways and methods to train ourselves to subdue our defilements, subdue our mind in many ways to disassociate our mind from the adventitious defilements. Defilements such as greed, hate and ignorance, jealousy and anger, these are never part of our mind and never will be. Only if we knew how to differentiate, create a boundary between our mind and that of defilements, we sure will all become practitioners of Vinaya, whether you have received formal vows or not. If you are, if you are effective in uh, demarcating the purity of your intrinsic mind from that of adventitious obscuration, we all can uh, and uh, manage to subdue our mind because mind is not allowed to be troubled uh, by the ephemeral reality that, that manifests before us. Defilements are like clouds and mist. Um, they are never clouds and mist are never nature of the sky. Uh, it is a problem for the people who have eyes. <laughs> uh, clouds never bother the sky. Uh, it's only those who need to see the sky. Uh, or the space finds cloud bit of a bit of a too much, and so when a person is learning the ways of vinaya, the ways of the self-subjugation, training our own mind, yeah, training our own mind, uh, then they find the teaching, the formal teachings of various lists of restrictions and do's and don'ts uh, that one need to need to observe are. Uh, useful mindful, I would say, useful guidelines of invoking mindfulness. We do not know where to start to become mindful. Buddha skillfully designed uh, these techniques uh, suited for two people of different levels of intelligence. <clears throat> so, therefore, the ancients, uh, the teachings of the Buddha that primarily dealt with how to subdue our mind from defilements and therefore karma, meaning our habituated pattern. Because there are certain, certain uh, ways or conduct that we seem to be us. We do not seem to be a pre, uh, differentiable from us, from our conduct. We are the conduct. But yet we do not. Some conduct or habit of ourselves may be part that we don't like ourselves even. But yet we don't seem to be able to disassociate from those habits or patterns. Now realizing those habits were never us and never will be. They were just mistaken habits. They were just erroneous beliefs that we happened to carry far too long than we had intended for. So Vinaya, or moral discipline, helps us to, uh, to know that we, uh, our karma and defilements are uh, adventitious. We might say, oh, I've been like this uh, for the last 40 years, but it particular, and even still then, in Buddhist point of view, it's, it's adventitious. You know? It's only 40 years. <laughs> 40 years are very short and when you compare with the, the length of eon. <laughs> so, so being able to look kindly that 40 years is not a big, a big length, length, long length of time that, you should, uh, you sh uh, that, uh, that we feel so bad about it. 40 years is, is, uh, is easily irascible. 
if your mind <laughs> learns how to how to correct itself from the techniques of subjugate techniques of vinaya so the monks and early disciples of buddha compiled all such vows and precepts pertaining to uh, the discipline of uh, uh, subduing our body uh, senses mind and speech in a particular way that we can that our habit our particular way of being doesn't become too much a cause of injury or violet violation of people's space freedom you know comfort and happiness so it's mainly a practice of uh, practice of harmlessness to begin with and hopefully it will turn into helpfulness but they never emphasize to begin with teachings of helpfulness uh, he emphasized the teachings of harmlessness as long as we are able to invoke a way of discipline that that uh, that cause no harm to us and others it will be the most uh, sound platform on basis of which we can uh, depart to benefit others that's why buddha himself uh, left a life of a king and retired in the seclusion part is a way of invoking the discipline of the uh, discipline of harmlessness because being in a royal family all the promise all illusory expectations but he had the foresight to see it's the kind of trap you now don't need any more and therefore however it sounded nice to keep someone happy just for the sake of keeping them happy to remain as a king uh, would have, it seemed very shallow it didn't help him it would not help any of his family members in the long run he had the foresight not to become entrapped in that any more and therefore had the courage to to uh, to find a way out uh, instead of staying in uh, mutual harmfulness he wanted to stay individual helpfulness <laughs> so so that's why most vinaya practices are pratimoksha individual liberations first of all we might find ways of how we can liberate ourselves from our own traits and habits and ha and propensities then only can we be free enough to help others because uh, unless we are self cleansed and purified uh, we cannot clean and purify others that's why the practice of seclusion that buddha had to spend so many years of his life after uh, living uh, becoming a monk uh is is very much uh, concordant with the teachings that uh, that echoes the importance of a vow of harmlessness any vow you take uh, a vow of prohibition saying you should i will not kill not steal and so forth all of this vow of prohibitions is not taking our freedom away uh but rather it is a way to adopt yeah it is a way of adopting that is in long term how one can avoid harm to ourselves and others we would like to know if we are doing everything that that are the causes of happiness why we have to prohibit if we are creating causes of happiness <laughs> we don't have to prohibit from eating and drinking and going hither and thither only if our going and eating create causes of happiness <laughs> so all the vows and precepts that design uh, that are designed by the in the teachings that are later compiled by the early disciples of the buddha are therefore uh, in, under the category of vinaya uh, vinaya could be found in three levels i suppose you could the vinaya based on the pratimoksha individual liberation vinaya based on uh, based on the motivation of altruism uh, that is a bodhisattva me vinaya and the vinaya based on esoteric vajrayana teaching so vinaya shouldn't be seen as exclusively something to do with only monastic vows it's not like that lay people have their own share of vows and precepts too and we shouldn't look down upon ourselves saying we are only a lay person the word laity uh, gives a very uh, very sort of lowly meaning in 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 our language but uh, in uh, buddhist tradition uh, particularly in a vajrayana mahayana context uh, laity doesn't mean that we have less responsibilities we just have more more is more worldly responsibility that <laughs> they tend to take over and therefore miss miss our spiritual share that we should be giving to our well-being um so in this way the the, the very experience uh, great experience of meditation that we would like all to have culminating to enlightenment doesn't come to us when we meditate unless we have a moral discipline like the vinaya uh, like particular precepts as a the lay person uh, at adopting refuge vows or one of the five precepts or or part or or a couple of them or all of them <laughs> 
When you observe those precepts, on top of that, you might take vows of bodhisattva or vajrayana vows, whatever you do. When you have some moral principles that you adhere to as a part of your practice, not only these are just things of list, a list of things yet that you do, but also it consolidates us to have a more formalism in your only daily practice. People who don't adhere to moral precepts have difficulty formalizing their practice as a routinization. They have difficulty in remaining consistent and genuine to keep their practice going because they do not know uh, the merit of the uh, merit of uh, maintaining these uh, strong regiment, strong regiment of keeping the practice as a daily commitment, you know. So most of the great masters who have wonderful profound experiences had, did not only achieve through daily practice but spending the rest of their life in meditation. Then only had the great melody, great experience and then uh, they share their melody, they share their inner intrinsic experiences in a form of songs, in a form of conversation or discourses or, or what not. So early teachings of the Buddha, uh, particularly including the early disciple Buddha, all the conversation teaching given by them and recounted the memories of teaching they have heard from Buddha are under the category of sutras. Later on, the, when Buddhism flourished, I was in India, about, about second century onwards, there came uh, no, galaxies of scholars who were doing meditation, and all of their realizations were, were sung in, song, in a form of, form of songs called, called Doha. These Doha are the songs, uh, songs of mystic uh, yogis, yogis who have spent their many, many years in meditation, transcending all form of conventional, not because they, they're acting as they are beyond things, but they actually have excelled uh, with the realization that is completely validated and it never relapsed because of the purity of their vows and precepts and devotion. This firm moral foundation keeps them well supported. If you don't have a sound moral discipline, your meditation practices only comes like a glimpse and never appears again. And it doesn't really repeat itself. It just becomes a flash of lightning but never stays long and one, ha one still have a very leaky basis uh, which, which cannot retain any experiences, let alone great ones. Those who are able to have great and profound experiences of meditation are mainly because they are well supported by the, by the firm, solemn commitment of the Vinaya or the moral precepts in general. So all the great Indian masters who sang uh, the ex meditative experiences became what is, what is, what is called Toha. Toha is very much sort of spontaneous expressions. It's a like, a like spontaneous expressions uh, un unaided by any, um, any theory, any convention, any fear, any hope, but it's just almost like speaking in tongues uh, out of deep spiritual uh, med evo evoked meditation, meditative experiences. So in India we had those it created teachers, uh, all the 84 Mahasiddhas of, of esoteric Buddhism, all have left behind them a uh, number, uh, number of Dohas. So Dohas, uh, uh, no, they are not really lengthy ones. They are very, very mystic experiences. And many people wouldn't understand the depth and under, uh, the meaning of the words because they use very cryptic languages. That requires uh, expert decoders, people who know the, such twilight language, as a twilight languages, meaning the language that requires a, a careful way to decode the meanings. It's deeply coded with, the, with the, some kind of mystical meaning uh, that is unique to the Buddhist uh, philosophy and teachings. It may use concepts and ideas uh, of, I would say, Indian Buddhist uh, ideas. Uh, and because of that, uh, in order to understand the deeper meaning of uh, those dohas, uh, one becomes a well-seasoned scholar and teacher in the, in the language and culture in which these are expressed. So dohas, when people study today, uh, find very difficult to understand. Of course, t the Tibetan followers of the Indian Mahasiddhas were much, uh, much more kinder to their, to their audience. They use languages that is very easily discernible, such as the song, the 100,000 songs of Milarepa. Uh, they're much easy. Uh, it seems like just normal conversation. <laughs> normal conversation. Uh, and uh, uh, almost, uh, whether it's a conversation to his sister or, or the hunter who became his disciple or, or the dis people who 
who would be his future disciples or whoever were there, all the conversation that is recorded um, in the book called Gurumbum, Mela Gurumbum, you know, the, uh, the book of 100,000 songs. I don't think there are 100,000 songs, but it means a lot. <laughs> the word 100,000 means a lot, you know. <laughs> but when you read the whole 100,000 songs of Mela Reba, there probably is a couple hundred at the most. There's not really a hundred thousand songs. <laughs> but the meaning, there are meanings and, and influence and ripple effect of those songs is definitely more than a hundred thousand people's heart and mind has been touched. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, what, what, is, what, uh, what is so unique about the, uh, the songs of meditators. Of course, Milarepa, although it seems to be engaging in ordinary conversation, but they were deeply saturated by realization of the teachings that he that became part of his being, part of his experience of medit uh, meditation. Now, Jitsun Trakpa Gyalse, whose uh, great uh, melody of experience that his eminence uh, will teach, has written no less than eight such very special uh, melody of experience called Nyam Yang, you know. Uh, it's real, nyam means experience, yang means melody. Uh, whether he sang it in a form of a song or not, uh, it's a, you don't really have to audially. It's not a kind of audial energy that makes you think it is a song. It's a song, the most highest form of music is that really makes so much sense, you know. It gives, it's keep humming in you even years after you heard it. That's a melody of experience. Not just something you heard it and then you have to applaud and then applaud and applaud, hope he'll come back and sing again. That's not melody of experience. That's gross sound attachment. <laughs> attachment, attachment to gross sound. <laughs> so uh, it's difficult, of course, to capture uh, the very pertinent meanings of, of writings in Tibetan and in English. Of course, uh, it's a very, very hard. Uh, linguistically, it's hard. And, and uh, even if you, you can understand exactly what's, what is intended, what is said in the Tibetan, but could not capture enough, <laughs> capture enough in no matter how well versed you are in the language you are translating or language from which you are translating. You know, no, you can't do enough service <laughs> to replicate the blessing of uh, uh, experience of a great meditator, yeah? I'm sure we could easily distribute the booklet, translation of these texts, to each of you, and you think you got it, but you don't. <laughs> so that's why you, you need a, uh, a living master who is himself the upholder of these teachings of lineage, and uh, one of the few, uh, I would say, great teachers of, of our time. You know, you hear great names of teachers when you, they, they don't live, you know. When they pass away, then they are great, you know. Then they are great. We think, oh, Shantarakshita, Padmasambhava, Melareva, Marpa, Tsongkhapa, Sakya Pandita. Well, I, was, I wonder what, what they were like if you were to see them in person. <laughs> You see? So when you have a teacher like his eminence, uh, eminence, uh, uh, you're, going to, you're not only going to, uh, of course his eminence will use the medium of Trakbhagyans and songs to expound and give the transmission thereof. But he will deeply, definitely saturate a more, a more a living tradition of, of the very, very teachings. So it is important for us to make connection with the living tradition because when you, it's very hard to become a lineage holder of a very reputed tradition. It's very hard. You know, you, to be the lineage holder, uh, meaning that you have to be the highly respected teacher in your generation. Not just by a couple of your friends or uh, people who, who are fond of you because of your particular <laughs> attractive qualities or whatever. It's that being the teacher of all teachers, of the teacher of all the great living masters today. And not to mention the teacher of the Sakya tradition in which, uh, to which this text belongs to. You can actually have any scholars try to comment theoretically and intellectually on this text. But little does that make difference to the minds of us as individuals seeking intellectual knowledge. These writings are not intellectual prowess or intellectual, you know, uh, our skill of, of, a, of a, scho a trained scholar to write simply, 
to entice the minds of who will read just that line once and for all. The writings or ex did, uh, I was uh, spontaneous expressions of uh, meditative experiences, as I said, is not for the temporal enjoyment of one who's listening and reading, but rather it is for the mind who, which is able to be deeply penetrated into the meaning so that the essence of the transmission actually hums in your heart and mind at all times, has a function to, to evoke deep experiences that we normally do not know how to transform adversarial circumstances into deeply moving experiences. When you receive the transmission of this kind from a living master, you definitely will have that, that um, your own sense of receptivity, your ability to receive things very well will be tuned. Being in attendance for this teaching uh, with his eminence is almost like entunement itself, in itself. When you become so in tune to the degree of making yourself so receptive uh, with the presence of a wonderful being, you know, a being who is uh, who's just by being around his vicinity or presence it makes you feel that it's a, it's a blessed time. It doesn't really matter whether you knew uh, every, every word is understood or translated or mistakenly translated or not. Uh, but st still you feel the blessing is just sinking in, <laughs> just being there. Most, very few teachers have the, such qualities. Only one or two amongst many will have those qualities. Most people worship people of great name and fame and reputation. Very few who, very few who, there are very few who has the true understanding and share, understanding of value of the teachings to be able to dis distinguish uh, what is called living masters. Most living masters are hidden yogis. Hidden yogis are usually, Milarepa became only famous after he passed away, remember that? Milarepa was not really famous when he was living. <laughs> very, very seldom, very, not many people knew where he was, who he was. He was not available. Only after he passed away in enlightenment, then one was, was he respected. His, his songs were collected together and his student, you know, uh, almost like uh, uh, administered his teachings and practices, the legacy of Milarepa, and it has become like that. So all the great, great, great teachers, religious masters in history, uh, they never were that well or famous at that, uh, uh, until they passed away, until their passing away become a culmination of the enlightenment of their life. So the experience, uh, experience of great, medita great meditators today uh, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition are written in form of uh, gur, and some word gur is the song, yang is also melody. So in, in, uh, like in, in India they were talking about dohas, in Tibet we have gur uh, or nyam. Nyam means experience, gur means songs really. Uh, a particular way of singing the, uh, the uh, mystic religious experience songs, like Melarepa's posture of his right hand always, uh, you know, lifting his chin is, is always, always, when he teaches, he's always doing that, you know. <laughs> um, like an opera singer, you know, always, always doing that. <laughs> he's a dharma singer, you know. <laughs> Melarepa, therefore, is often depicted in this, you know. Uh, that's because it's often when he's speaking. Nowadays, I think I think it's always like Mike. <laughs> no, this is a good, big, big ice cream cone <laughs> and friend <laughs> with lapel mic, mics. I think the, the things are different. So I don't know. In in maybe two hundred years time, I don't know how the how uh, like his eminence songs will be. How how we would depict his eminence? A lapel mic here. <laughs> <laughs> Milarepa in those days just like and often his audience was just one or two. A deer maybe, <laughs> a deer or wild fox. A hunter, perhaps. Not a many big crowd. That'll do. <laughs> good teachers don't need many disciples. They just need a few good ones. Buddha himself started with five. So don't get confused with the crowd and in <laughs> crowds, gatherers necessarily. <laughs> necessarily, you know. It's not an entertainment we are here. We are here to, you know, seek the spiritual truth. 
So therefore, the practitioners of, of uh, ancient tradition have a way of sharing their experiences of meditation. And um, of course, he's, I will leave much of the background of Trakpa Gyaltsen and whatever relevant part his eminence explained. But what I thought would be important for all of you particularly new is how does, where, what conditions allow anybody to develop these deep meditative experiences. This great uh, meditative experiences is only cultivated by a practitioner who is keen and devoted and self-disciplined, as I mentioned before, and one who has resorted to them at a conducive place, in a place of solitude, where one has uh, completely, I would say, re uh, avoided from the hustle-bustle life of uh, worldly activities, one who has completely renounced those activities and have res uh, retired into seclusion Seclusion. seclusion really means one who is able to be with themselves with a very great sense of contentment and happiness. And what do you do if we, we, we weren't around people, you know? And our, uh, our life very much centers around not with us, but with other people all the time. When those, our everyday to day experience, if you were to sing a song of your today's experience end of the evening, it would be called a different song. <laughs> oh, I hated that or something like that. Yeah, why you hated that? Because you're talking about somebody all the time, how he was, how she was, and how they were. You know, we carried that kind of stories <laughs> and come home, you know, because our association is with people and circumstances other than ourselves. So our, great, our melody of experiences are not quite melodious at all. <laughs> they don't really sing well. Uh, we don't least like to listen. We don't like to replay that anymore, but we keep replaying them however haunting they may be, but we don't know how to not to play them. But great religious, religious masters, having, <laughs> having uh, gone into seclusion where they don't have interaction with things other than their mind, huh? things other than their mind, so they, they are totally able to free their mind, free their eyes, free their ears, free their, uh, I would say, tastes and touch and everything, except the seat that they are sitting on. Maybe a rock, or maybe under a tree, or maybe just a deer, a deer skin maybe is the only mattress. The rest is just pure nature. <laughs> just breeze, rain, sunshine, birds chirping, and no, no, no other interactions. These are very natural, nothing provoked by the meditator, of course. They happen no matter what. You know, so, so when a meditator is able to stay in great, great seclusion, yeah, they are able to get a sense of freedom from things external that they usually, we usually lay blame on as the causes of our misery and unhappiness. Meditators learn to how to be free from those objects of trouble. And only then they give, give them the space and opportunity to have an intrinsic experience of the nature on their own mind. Unless one is able to uh, disassociate from place of distraction, place of temptation, objects of aversion, objects of attachment, object that entraps yourself out of out of erroneous love that you feel for something, but actually you're trapped and injured by the very association you feel you need to have. Great meditators have the courage and discernment that it is more cause of one's own downward hill, downward, uh, downward sort of, uh, you know, going downhill. So instead of becoming tempted, instead of being trapped in those, uh, learns, to st learns to withdraw themselves from those objects of negativities and defilements, and therefore go and retire into seclusion. Now, uh, that being ability to retreat, you know, ability to retreat, you know, when people go into a short retreat, we call, he, he's gone in retreat. What he's doing physically is, is retreating from the normal objects of association, as simple as that. They wouldn't see the uh, same people, or they wouldn't do the s same things they do every week, and they wouldn't have the type of responsibilities conversation that normally have. They're retreating from all of that. That, ret that uh, act of retreation, that act of, act of retreat is seclusion practice. Seclusion practice is almost giving yourself the whole attention that you deserve. When we do not retreat, 
we are not even being able to give a partial attention to ourselves, let alone the whole attention. When we don't pay whole attention to anything, the quality that we produce is, is, uh, is not, not good enough to keep us happy. Quality of the product of what we do is often dissipated and there's a lot of ho gaps and holes that still need to be filled. And we constantly are there to patch up things and, and what we didn't do yesterday we have to patch up today and what we didn't do well today we patch, try to patch up next. There are some even don't, we don't even acknowledge need patching up and only later on we realize they need to be patched up. Because our attention is very dissipated and therefore we, are, we aren't able to uh, uh, achieve or execute things very well because we are not aware of the cause and effect relationship. Now when you're able to retreat from all things of objects of defilements, when you retire yourself in a particular place, what you're doing is you're not only retreating from things, but you're entreating to yourself. You're, you're, you're actually pleading and requesting to yourself to have some strength and inner courage in a sense of contentment without having to resort to those objects and feel completely adequate on your own without needing to talk to somebody or without needing to do something or go somewhere. And, and being able to be on one's own is in itself, is in itself uh, a, 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 a great sort of ability. Uh, so that retreating is almost like your mind is not uh, ensnared in things external. Then you're able to reclaim the nature of the mind that is, that is clear and empty as it always has been. Because it is no longer beclouded by things external. Otherwise, object, we are all, all uh, when we are not retreating, we are all object control subjects. You know? uh, in order to become otherwise, you know, you know, in order to become subject control objects, <laughs> so you go to a place of seclusion and without needing so many objects, your subjective self is just as contented and happy as it needs to be. And when you're able to do that, then you're giving the basis for, for the great experience of meditation to occur because you're, you're, you're creating sacred ground. You're, cre you're blessing the place of your meditation that is completely untroubled by things external. Only you have to guard is that that mind that may still be going backwards and forwards, but being able to retreat yourself and make the request, entreat yourself, don't go away, don't go away, and stay with me here. Now, when you're able to, when you have that monologue, you know, often we're busy dialoguing with people, you know. When meditation is a monologue where you're talking to yourself, uh, and you might even hear what you really want to talk to yourself. Because if you want to talk to somebody and you never got the opportunity, you feel very bad, don't you? Now, if you didn't get to talk to yourself, oh, you have good reason to feel bad. <laughs> Because if you can't look after the well-being of us, ourselves as individuals who, with whom we don't spend time, you can see part of your dissatisfaction is because you don't pay enough attention even to your well-being, let alone for the sake of others. So meditation is a, therefore is the most effective cause of happiness for oneself and others. Therefore, uh, choosing a very uh, conducive place of meditation, what is called retreating in a place of meditation, is the first basis where all the great meditators like Thakpa Gyanse would have got their great meditative experiences. Milarepa would have never sung those beautiful songs to his sister or to anybody for that matter, had he not, had he not remained in cave that is, uh, that is not accessible to the general public and is completely away from everything so that he, he definitely had the space for himself. He didn't, didn't need, the, need the help of anybody, he just had to be self-sufficient. When he didn't become a burden to anybody, he was completely adequately being able to live on a very simplicity, being able to virtually live on a very simple diet of nettle and, and wild, wild, wild berries maybe <laughs> and whatever. He just simply lived on that and being able to sustain. That's because he, he completely understood the, the qualities of solitude that is explained in the sutras and the writings of Shantideva. He definitely would have taken them as a teachings and not just nice ideas, but he really took it for in heart and went and resorted to that place of solitude. He gained the very blessing, you know, every, it's called power of situation, power of situation. If you find yourself in a solitude, place of solitude with nobody, it completely brings you to something that you never have paid attention to. 
if you are in a particular town or particular group of people, it creates a situation even you having to, without having to do anything. You just become part of the consumer of the situation. You can't have a say in the situation because it's there for you, it's ready-made. You can just try the size number 14, that'll do. You don't have to make one. Everything is created situation for you. You don't have to. You don't have to create from the from the, from scratch. You know, we are so used to into fitting into a situation, never having to create anything. You see, so when the great meditators uh, retired from the worldly life and in, in, in the place of solitude, they are actually doing the opposite. You know, they they are they are trying to recreate the situation through their mind. Almost the whole place where they dwell in a simple, just maybe maybe five by five, five feet by five uh, square feet, maybe cave. You know, oh, this will do. Hmm. As long as I don't stand up too quickly, <laughs> I just get up slowly and don't bump my head up, and I just sit in there and will shelter enough, no wind will blow me, I'll sit here and mindfully just being there. <laughs> it doesn't say, oh, where will I put my towels, where will I put my, hang my clothes, uh, never have to worry, all of those, those attachments, you know. Completely in fitting in the situation that was there and making the best of the situation that was at his disposal. And not making a list of demands that I need this, 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 this in order that I can stay here two days. <laughs> People could be very, very easily sort of irritable about where they're going to sleep in retreats. They don't want to go to retreat, remember? Because they don't like the place to sleep. They don't want to share a room with three people snoring or not snoring. We can't even stand that. I mean, I mean, even if you have a place of your own, you still will have to deal with ants and ants and wild beasts that will come in their way. Maybe you're in their territory. You will always have to deal with something. <laughs> so, so people like Dragba Gyanze and Milareva ha had to totally have control over the situation. They don't, they, they don't demand a particular situation except they go to a place of solitude and then create the best of our, all the situations. If one is constantly battling with the circumstances external, one hasn't even begun the journey. One is still sleeping on the first step, you know, sleeping back on the first step, and one is not even getting, getting to firmly ground one's feet on the first step. The first step is being able to feel, feel content and happy in the place of solitude and completely not missing anything. Now you've got hands completely engaged to the practice that you have, uh, you have received to go and do just that. One who couldn't be content with the place of solitude or place of meditation uh, uh, has a long way to go indeed. So that's why the, of the, of the six prerequisites for a person to do uh, effective uh, retreat of meditation is a place, a conducive place of meditation, where you are, not only place should be conducive, but mind itself is able to thankfully appreciate all the things that are there, whatever it is, the size, the height, the, 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 whatever, everything you have, you just completely appreciate with a sense of gratitude. You thank all the enlightened ones and your parents and families, people who have made it possible, and then being able to, uh, being able to utilize the energy that is there. That is the first, first of the six prerequisites for a meditator to have experience is Fully feeling totally adequate and thankful for all the things that are there, whether, whether it's high or narrow or cold, so be it. <laughs> you know, just being able to accept that. That's the first basis for any great experience of meditation can occur is contentment. One who has too so many demands is already troubled. Whether you are in solitude or whether with people, doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know, it's probably better you mix with people <laughs> if, you're not, if you're not able to stay contented where you are. So there was the difference. Difference is uh, as a person who is able to retreat in a place and then stay contained. You know, the, all the great meditators have experiences because they're able to stay in there 
with the vow and resolution they made with constant happiness and who whatever is the basic necessity they have maybe food and clothing all this is, they see each and everything they have is very very uh, gratefully with a sense of gratitude and um, because of that one is able to constantly uh, reconsecrate the place day by day as a, as a place not because you go you don't go to the place because of what the place is like because you can do what you want to that's very important, you see. So it's not so much the place, but what you're doing there. What have you come there to do? It's not any worldly activities. It is totally spiritual practice and service of the Dharma for the greater, greater benefit of many. When one is able to resolutely remember, remind oneself of this motivation, then the certain deficiency of the place also become too superfluous. It doesn't really become a trouble to you anymore because you are able to overcome these things. Unless one is able to do that, then one will be troubled by the, by, if one isn't able to appreciate the place you are of your meditation, place of your meditation, you will be troubled by, you won't have the second prerequisite, that is the second prerequisite is very much emotional prerequisite. Emotional prerequisite is one who is, one has few desires, one who, whose list of demands are very minimum. Almost like anything will do type of thing. If there's, a, if there's only half a glass of water, they'll do. If there's no water at all, they'll do too. <laughs> that kind of contentment, uh, when one is able to do that. If one is listening to all the sensory demands, then that, is, that completely jeopardizes the very retreat that one is doing, very meditation that you are, you are doing. Second is where the fewness of desire, meaning that you try to minimize your needs or wishes of, of things. When you're able to minimize your needs, then you're dealing with the greed already. Your greed and attachment are the two, um, one of the very, um, very obstructive forces in us that, make, that prevents our ability to practice well. So the second prerequisite being uh, for a meditator to occur to develop great meditative experiences is because their mind is free. If their mind is free of all desires, then sure, only experience of meditation can occur. Otherwise, what, what is on their mind is what they are, haven't been fulfilled with. Their wishes are thinking over things. Amazing what is on our mind, you know. That says a lot about us, us as a practitioner. When, when, you're in, when you're in retreat, what is your mind thinking about? Is it, is it following the practice happily and gratefully? Or is it thinking about certain things that wasn't quite fulfilled? And the window isn't just right because it's have some cold air coming through there. Is it only if the window was better, my retreat would go well. You know, that kind of, oh, something is always bothering us. You know, only if, only if the morning sun didn't, didn't really didn't shine on my nose, that would be okay. I wish the window was over here, Tabari. Something always bothers our mind. You know, we don't, we don't seem to be able to make friends with things as they are. And that, that's because we have this second prerequisite quite not met. <laughs> there, there's still some, 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 Small but still, <laughs> still new, irrit irritable desires uh, coming in our mind, and we crave for certain things, and we do not, we don't have the ability to brush them aside and keep focus in our practice. However minor they may be, still they stay on our mind all the time. Now that is the second obstacle we have to deal. The great meditators have to deal with that, because they have to decidedly uh, learn to stay contented with the things that they are as they are. So the vow of poverty, vow of simplicity. Vow of simplicity is the first prerequisite for the meditation to occur. How would Milarepas live, you know, be able to sustain his motivation? Uh, of course, I'm sure he would have felt thirsty. I'm sure he would have liked a warm jacket. I'm sure he had all this yearning, but he dealt them as they arose, you know. <laughs> He, he wasn't straight away saying, putting a list of orders, come here, bring next week a warm jacket for me, you know. Otherwise, I'm not going to continue my, continue my retreat. He learned to deal with the desire that was causing trouble. He wasn't constantly seeking those things. That's why it is second of the th six prerequisites, is that not only fewness of desire, but being able to deal with the desires without constantly listening to them and fulfilling their, their irrational demands. One learns how to subjugate them, uh, because that's the very practice that one is doing there, you know. Sometimes it may, there might be not much a practice other than just deal with that 
and of your formal practice might be just a routine. But, uh, but the real gist of it is being able to deal with these kind of grievances that you keep having trouble with. And uh, I'm sure the great practitioner like Milarepa and Trakpagyanze dealt with this very, if you don't deal with second, you know, if you don't allow yourself to have an ideal uh, second prerequisite of meditation, sure we will have no great experiences. We will have difficult experiences. Almost like you feel like you have put yourself in hell. Why do I want to stay in this cave? I want to go. I want to have a bar. I want to have ice cream. I want to see my friends. Where are they? What are they doing? <laughs> All of them, they become very important. <laughs> Everything becomes very important. Because your mind is now not, not stay contented in the situation that you are. You're completely falling prey to desire. One particular desire doesn't mean only only in a, on a on a on a on a sensual level, you know. Not only sensual level. Desire just means craving, you know, craving for something that is completely unproductive for our practice. But we do not know how to switch it off our mind, and that always <laughs> always continue to play uh, as a, it becomes a hindrance. So, when, the, when we hear the melody of great experiences of meditators, when we hear that, they have those experiences because they dealt and made themselves fully equipped with these prerequisites. And the third one, of course, is, is very much a, a culmination of the second prerequisites. It's contentment, fully content, always happy. You know? Always happy. You know? Everything is Everything is perfectly fine. There's nothing, a thing that you need to do. You all they need to do just appreciate things as they are, whether it's uh, rainy or windy or whether cool breeze blowing or not. You know, you know, you're able to trans. You're able to adapt yourself to the situation. You're not resisting with the situation. If the cool breeze is blowing through your window, you actually appreciate. Oh, this isn't the quite kind of cool air I need in winter. But this is the sort of cool air I need for the heat of my deformance. Thank you very much. <laughs> so one is able to, <laughs> one is able to utilize, you know, <laughs> metamorphically, you know, uh, that although the cool air breeze is something you don't need when you're feeling already cold, but you still know I am still suffer from the heat of my deformance. So maybe this is the breeze of realization I need to learn to appreciate. <laughs> when you do that, you have the third prerequisite. Third prerequisite is contentment. Being able to transmute and adapt yourself to the circumstances there without waiting it to change into something. And until that circumstance, you will suffer as a result. When we are that, we haven't got the sec third prerequisite. We're still waiting for some, something to change, A to B. Until the A becomes B, we will have to suffer. You know? And that is a person who hasn't dealt you know, uh, wouldn't be a great meditator, would we? One who is still stuck with the craving. And one who is able to be contented with seeing things as they are. One learns to appreciate everything that is there are there. And things are constantly changing. You might as well appreciate however short-lived things are. You know, because if you don't appreciate now, it won't be there anymore. And whatever comes next, you mightn't be able to appreciate anyway. <laughs> so you don't have a culture of being able to appreciate anything. <laughs> so I might as well learn to appreciate small things first. So the third prerequisite for a great meditator to have great experience is one who, who is completely contented and more gratitude uh, in one's mind. And even when one is having temporal difficulties, maybe temporal difficulties, you don't feel certain things, but, but still the mind is think back. The wonderful times that you have given yourself the opportunity to stay in a retreat. You may have prayed many years so that you can be in a retreat, and now you are in it. Huh? And when, oh, I have fulfilled my wishes and I'm busy, busy being miserable. What's this? And all of a sudden, yeah, I have at least allowed myself to fulfill my wishes. That's great. I'm at least in retreat. <laughs> and then you can so, transform the situation. So even though it's difficult, your mind is able to make a leap, <laughs> make this giant leap. So the circumstances at, at current doesn't really allow you to bother. But your mind is able to think, this is my realize, uh, my wishes granted to be in retreat. Thankful. I can only make progress from here onwards. That's, a, that's, a, that's the third prerequisite is coming to fulfill in the minds of practitioner. Because when we talk about prerequisites, we're talking about ideal situation. How do you idealize? How can you make things ideal? Uh, 
physically without without learning to make up, become uh, adapt your mind to the circumstances because circumstances constantly changing yeah? so, so you can't have one ideal situation think everything is ideal as if everything is permanent even situation changes you know so uh, also situation changes if your mind is not adapted to the situation that's uh, you know there are no ideal situations as external your mind has to make it ideal with all changing circumstances uh, and changing circumstances when the buddha sat under in a river bank of river niranjana whichever direction he faced i'm sure he would have just kept sitting there you know of course uh, more you know you know when he was maybe if he was facing west when the morning sun rose from the east and it kept kept his back warm, it was very good. But in the afternoon when the sun rose straight on his eyes, would have been, he would have thought otherwise. He would have liked to change a bit, turn a little bit, like so, but he didn't. He just sat there, sat there and sat there. And that's why his body turned into so weak and, uh, and lose all the weight there is and stay there with a great sense of endurance. Because he was being able to uh, fulfill the third prerequisite of contentment. Being able, so he said, oh, only a while, the sun will move. <laughs> and I need to adapt to all changing circumstances. If I don't do it today, how am I going to do it tomorrow? I will be, keep moving all the time, just like a restless mind do. And I, I learned not to do that. That's why the diamond posture, the posture of so indestructible, that represent his vow not to move, and vow, vow not to be easily tilted by changing circumstances, but remain strong and firm. That it is a vow, it is a promise, and therefore might as well keep it unbroken. So, he's one who has this vow, keeping that promise, of course they are therefore able to fulfill this third prerequisite of one doing meditation retreat. Meditation retreat. And the fourth one, fourth prerequisite for a person to develop great meditation and experience in meditation is, is a few news of activities, re minimizing all other activities uh, except to practice and be in the practice. So no sewing of, sewing of no mending of clothes or reading the, the last two chapters of the chapters of the novel you brought in, not that kind of, none of those activities allowable in retreat. You just don't read things or do things other than that is totally con relevant to the practice thereof. And if you happen to have free time, watch the breath. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore you just you just you just you just don't do not engage in because every other activity generates a energy that that is relevant to the activity so if you're reading a book uh, it's a fictitious book just to think that you are doing a little bit of having a break well, you don't need a break from practice practice is much better is kept throughout without break if you have giving a break to your practice you know it's a trouble you know? <laughs> practice doesn't need break really and, and that's why even if you are you're resting a while, still the mind is at ease, you know. You're not trying to feel that you're so exhausted you need to regain some energy. You never feel fatigued uh, as a result of that. You're, you're being in the practice. You're able to manage your time handsomely so that you do not see yourself doing this or that. You see how I'm sticking very well with the routine of my practice. Often this will, of course, will be guided and discussed with your spiritual master and being able to adhere and stick with that so that you do not change and, and cut and paste at your will. When you're doing that, of course, you, all what you're doing is you're just adapting to the neurosis. And, and not adhering to the way of the enlightened ones, where we have to endure practice of patience. Where is our practice of patience? Why are we compromising here? How are we compromising today? Because it is like that, I can't do this. Because it's like that, I can't do this. So the reasons of excuses are far too, too many. <laughs> and that is one of the causes of laziness was because we tend to have a lot of, listen to all the uh, uh, personal excuses. And when you're doing that, um, you, if, you're, if you're excusing yourself from doing not the practice, not starting as early as you would like, what are you doing? Lying down. Or, or that's a doing, that's a one of the doings that they say you should minimize other than the practice. So one become attached. Anything will be attractive to be doing except the practice. It could be nice to walk, you know. Uh, it could be nice to watch the birds. Bird doesn't need to be watched. You know, what are you doing to the birds? Nothing, really, you know. <laughs> you know, the path doesn't need to be walked, you know. You know? So all of a sudden, everything becomes important. Everything becomes appealing and attractive, except doing the practice. <laughs> That's a sign of uh, trouble. 
not being able to meet the fourth prerequisites, being, you know, reducing, minimizing other activities. <laughs> minimize. If one isn't able to minimize other activities, but one is, a, one is able to find attractive things to do, be doing those things. But this doesn't mean you shouldn't allow time for, uh, uh, time for relaxation and have a uh, incorporating your practice with uh, our say, neutral activities such as like they make stupas, they make st traditionally in the teachings they say people in order to have a break from the sessions they can make tzatza, stupas, small tzatzas physically, something physically engaging yeah? making stupas, bless them and you dedicate for each sentient being and have them all print prayer flags <laughs> print fair flags or, 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 or circumambulation or fill water bowls uh, as offering to the enlightened ones and empty them and fill again. So you are, you're not totally sitting there feeling so rigid, but you're doing some physical activity as well as the practices. And the, the, every other thing that you are doing are prescribed practices that are incorporatable, that you can incorporate as part of being in retreats. Doing things that are not prescribed in the teachings that you can do as a as a as a way to incorporate your practices. So often that is one suffer from the uh, from not being able to fulfill the fourth prerequisites of a good meditator uh, who couldn't minimize the, the, the distractive activities. Now the fifth one is uh, remaining true to your moral discipline, purity of your moral discipline, whatever that is, however, however minimum those vows are. And say, say there are vows, for instance, even if you're just a lay person who has just basically taken, taken refuge and that's all you are, but you're still doing retreat, you take those vows of refuge and maybe the, uh, uh, take the 24-hour vows every now and then throughout the retreat, maybe every day, if not once, every Every alternate days or once in a couple of days so you adhere to those precepts so faithfully and keeping the vows that you have come in with and try to consolidate the vows that you have in the retreat if you are guarding your vows and precepts in the retreat more I was especially than you were in our, our everyday life of course that becomes a, a careful a additional focus of concentration it reinforces your concentration and therefore you are your your practice of more Moral discipline isn't some kind of imposed thing to you by somebody, but it's a voluntary discipline you have asked and asked for yourself to take on in order to benefit oneself and others. So because of that, one's moral discipline becomes even more worthy to be practicing. So you feel so happy that you are doing the fulfilling a wish and promise and a vow that you have. And as a person who's happy and guarding their moral precept in retreats has the fifth of prerequisites correct because they 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 their focus is very clear and they're not untroubled by any things other than to maintain their vows and dedicate each day's practice for the benefit of all sin. Not with the wish to come out as a, as a puritanical person saying that, oh, you've got to be like that, otherwise people should know, but uh, uh, making very, very judgmental of other people who doesn't fit with one dis one's own description of what a moral moral person we ought to be. Being able to have understand that others are totally in different levels of intelligence and background and their capacity. So once moral vows, instead of becoming that which gives an eye of judgment of other people, that once moral discipline totally sanctifies our own purity within ourselves and that much have the compassion, compassion eyes with which views the nature of as living other sentient beings. So the Fifth one is purity of your moral disciplines. Uh, moral discipline in the purity of moral discipline meaning that is, of course when a person comes to uh, do a retreat they have vowed themselves I'm going to go like the Buddha made a vow that he said I'm not going to move from this seat until I ex experience the elixir of bliss that was his, 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 his promise that he said I'm not going to come out of here until I experience and taste the flavor of bliss means enlightenment you know and whereas uh, uh, most recent times people are ah oh, three week retreat two months retreat uh, until I finish this many prostration <laughs> until I reach this many mantras until I uh, oh next three weeks that's all the holiday I have people do it I mean just being able to stick even with that time that you have allocated to do it's a quite a good 
good target to be able to reach. So I have three weeks, I'm going to stay in retreat. Being able to fulfill one's promise with which one walked into the retreat until the last day of the day of the retreat. How happily would a person come out, a gift that he, will, he or she will always cherish for the rest of life if they're able to fulfill their wishes. So that's why moral discipline is something that you, our sense of uh, esteem of self must be respectable. If you're able to fulfill your own expectation, and uh, realistic expectation, this is not unrealistic expectation, fairly realistic expectation, and being able to fulfill them with steadily and carefulness, we will be a lot happier. We are creating more sound basis, fertile ground of mind to have realization of meditation. If we don't have that sense of sense of fertile fertility of our mind that is, that, is, that is able to adhere to the precepts of the promises we have made to ourselves, we will feel ourselves bad about us having not fulfilled that. And because of that, the, the, the fifth requirement is one who is able to sincerely maintain one's vows and promises that one, with which one has stepped into the retreat or stepped into. Now the great meditators who have experience of melody of experience comes because they fulfill all this gradual process of the requirement for, for ideal meditation retreat. And of course, last but not least of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the six, uh, of the six prerequisites is fewness of concepts. <laughs> fewness of conceptual, fewness of thought. <laughs> I mean, it's just go beyond thought. To be, to have no thought, really. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't mean that you are not, you shouldn't be thinking in meditation. Oh, am I not allowed to have thought for the rest of my life? Am I type of attitude? It's not that. You just, you just corner each thought. You just alienate each thought from the rest of the past thoughts and <laughs> whatever future thoughts they're going to be. Try to delink the thought, present thought, from the past and the future. And uh, uh, if if you're able to keep that, even though all the other five prerequisites are not really perfectly fine, <laughs> but as you are able to fulfill the six prerequisites, you will be you will be able to, I would say, go into the ranks of great meditators. Why are you a great meditator? Because you're able to deal with your thought. <laughs> you're, able to, you're able to minimize your thought, meaning you do not become, you do not fall prey to your incoherent thought. Firstly, you see the thought rising. Secondly, you see, uh, as soon as you see a thought rising, you do not, you don't become the thought. That's the whole thing. If you're aware of your thought rising, then you do not become the thought because you are the seer, remember that. You are the seer of the thought. You know, so the, the, what is seen is not you, it's only a thought, you see. Uh, if you're able to have, uh, distinguish, distinguish yourself from the thought, then you do not become a uh, victim of the thought. You actually have an ability to say what, you, what you're going to do with that thought. Now, when, you have, when you're in the middle of a certain thoughts that come to you, you have a trouble, you know. You feel fearful of something. It means you have jumbled up so many thoughts of fear together and made it into a little chapter, you know. And if you read it, it looks awfully fr frightful. <laughs> so you have a thoughtful chapter of thoughts. <laughs> you know, you have a, sorry, so you have a chapter of thoughts that is all fearful, you know? And you do not know how to distinguish one word from the other. They all make sense, you know. You all make sense and you really think there's something out there that you've got to worry, you know. And that's because you are not able to minimize your thoughts. You have, you have, instead of minimizing, you have made links with thoughts. You can see amazing links with all the thoughts. And there's a wonderful story to be told. And it is true. You can't, you can't erase that from your mind. It's just keep replaying, you know. You don't know how to undo it. It's just keep replaying. It just comes back again and again. It regurgitates and replays even. Every time you replay it, it seems more real than it is, you know. And one's mind could not go away from that, constantly stuck with those thoughts. That's the f most stumbling, you know, hardest stumbling block, I think, of all meditators is not being able to deal with the thought. Of course, when, uh, so the sixth one uh, is the six prerequisites is, of course, mo what most people get trouble in the meditation. And when you have received the uh, 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 proper instructions, guidance, and if, you know, when you're adhering to all the requirements, particularly the first five prerequisites, of course, slowly one learns to see the thought, because normally we don't even see the thought. 
and we are able to singularize the thoughts. We are able to alienate the one thought from the rest. That's a wonderful ability. You can almost stand between two thoughts and not let them make friends, you know, or make them talk and say, oh, come over here, we can go together. You just stand, no, no, you're not allowed to meet him. <laughs> you can stand between two thought and, and being able to, you know, the, his eminence keep quoting Sakya Pandita, is that when you're able to, when you're able to stand between past thoughts and future thoughts and, and give us pause there, you have got the awareness. You have got the cognition of the nature of your mind that's completely free. It is completely empty. When you have thought, it's not empty because you're busy having that thought. You're completely filled. You become that thought. When your mind is free, however short a split of a second that might be, yeah, but yet you can discern it with amazing sense of clarity and discernment. You never knew how to appreciate. It is indescribably vast and free and transcendental. If your practice of meditation is progressing properly, you will discern this um, freedom from thought, not only in meditation, but also when you're not doing formal practices. They're just, there's even one moment is, one moment is too long to be, for, <laughs> to be missing that opportunity, let alone the day, a week, a rest of your time in retreat. When you're able to have that, then, of course, you have, you have completely fulfilled the sixth requirement. And, of course, then, um, and the, all the experiences of meditation, the various degree stages of the meditation, right, whether in sutra or tantra or, or the stages of the bodhisattva path or arhats or whatever, all the stages of nine stages of calm abiding meditation, all of this culminates to the state, state reaching the uh, state of what is called path of seeing part of seeing and a special inside. And much of the melody or great melody of experience talk by Gansi writes is all about the path of seeing onwards. All many to do that transcend the duality of good and bad and meditation and no meditation. You and my I, samsara and nirvana, self and other, Buddha and sentient being. All the dualities that really makes, makes the world become so engaging, I think, is completely transcended. So this is much, much of Thakpa Gansi's expression really echoes those, he calls great melody of experience. It's great in the sense it transcends the ordinary, the ordinary melody that you have to listen to something or that is, that is of that tune or that tune. It's, it is actually transcend audio language. It is not something people can sing to you that you need to hear it again. It is actually only self-cognizable. It's only have to be validated your personal experience. It is not something people can do it for you. It is great in that sense. It is great because you have to do it. You have the complete authority to do it and no one can obstruct it but you. <laughs> so it is great because, because of that. It's not that someone has to sanction you, give the permission to realize it. It is, it is great because it is, it is as vast as the space. The, inf the possibility of you realizing is much greater because every moment, of, every moment is, is, a, is a fertile ground for realizing non-thought. There is no great time, there is no holidays or festive days, or <laughs> that is much better, better time for you to realize this great experience of meditation. Because of meditation, you, you, are, you are going to be able to, you know, the opportunity is, uh, is almost like incessant. There's incessant, there's it's constancy. There's Melody is that you are not only the you are not only the opportunity exists all the time without anything obstructing you, but the melody is the deep inner uh, I was a recognition of that. Melody is something that you hear from within yourself, something in you that that echoes. When you hear certain teachings that really you understand, it's because you have been thinking about a while in your mind. And when that melody, when that tune is sung by somebody, it's always, you, you knew that, you, you knew that. You knew that you believe in that long time ago. You just need to reconfirmation from someone. 
And so that's why you don't really come to hear anything, you know, from externally. You just need to hear the, the kind of, uh, I would say, very, very obscure but undiscerned and unclear uh, sound that you have heard from the yearnings or cries of your own mind for so long, yeah? Uh, but when it, is, when it is spoken through the theory of the teachings, the format of the Dharma, it's, it is more melodious, you know? Although you have your own sufferings, you never knew the sufferings were truth. <laughs> <laughs> it need, you, we needed the teachings to tell that, that, that you have sufferings. <laughs> and it, 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 we need the teachings to tell that you create the self causes of suffering. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. And then it sounds so true, so melodious, so, in, so, so exact. We knew those all the time, but we forgot. <laughs> so when the teaching is sung, when the reality is sung from the teachings, it is very melodious. <laughs> it makes sense. It completely uh, c captures your whole sense of imagination. It totally makes yourself magnetized by the very sound that you have heard. This may therefore have to be triggered by a lineage master, a wonderful teacher, whose very being around him causes you to feel that. You cannot do that with anybody. You go to somebody, tell them that they tell you their story of life story. They say how badly they've been abused, what they have gone through, what abusive life they have had. They tell you all this, but it doesn't really echo the melody of truth. <laughs> it just jumbles up the suffering more, and we may even go to help them to worsen the suffering. It just doesn't give us discernment, the causes of suffering, and doesn't have the sense of upliftment that we could, we could uh, have from hearing the teachings of the Dharma and then understand the nature of the suffering. We are, we are, we are, the, we are all, you know, uh, uh, living examples of suffering. <laughs> we just need the teachings to echo that, and, and, and we give full credit to the teachings. But actually we should give full credit to ourselves, because had we not suffered that much, we would never understand the noble truth of suffering. We would never understand noble truth of suffering, because we wouldn't know what it's like to suffer, <laughs> let alone it being truth. Is it? So we, therefore, that's what the Buddha says, uh, you know, the Arya Satya, noble truth, you know. It's the truth, not only is truth, it's, it's the exalted truth, a truth that actually could not be discernible for the mind of others who are completely in, in, entrapped, you know, completely entrapped in uh, seeing the causes of their suffering, something external. Only it is exalted truth. It's ex it is truth only in the sense that one needs to understand the, the causes of suffering are here in, within our own mind. That's a much harder truth to know. Very few have the ability to show that as the truth because most people are, are, are helping each other to see the cause of your suffering as somebody else. We hire the most intelligent uh, people to find out what is our trouble, what is the cause of our trouble how we can make sure somebody is convicted that they really have been the cause of our trouble. We hire the highest offices of court system to prove others wrong. It's not truth at all. It's truth in the justice system, but it's not noble truth. <laughs> noble truth is one who's able to see the causes thereof is within one's own self. A conventional world doesn't know doesn't want to know that because it's too painful, unfortunately, to everybody. <laughs> you see, usually when you when you distinguish between truth and truth and truth and false, so one is happy and the other is not. You know, but when you hear the noble truth, it makes everybody knows. Everybody has this connection with that truth because it, it makes sense to everybody's mind who can discern the truth that that is so eloquently expounded in the teaching. It's a melodious, because it's not something that the, 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 the rhythm goes away from your mind. It has made an imprint. That's what, therefore, dharma is, not scriptural dharma, is the relative dharma. Realizational dharma is that when you have realized the truth, it constantly echoes. It hums in your life and mind all the time. Whether you have the scriptures or whether you're saying the mantras or not. The truth of the teaching constantly hums in your mind wherever you go. You see suffering. You can, you can see the suffering being created. You can see the suffering being troubled and doubled and tri uh, tripled as you see. Then, of course, it pains you deeply in your mind. But look, this is what the beings create suffering. We, yet most of them are unaware. 
Nobody knows they are creating suffering, do they? Unfortunately, they all create suffering unconsciously. Nobody creates suffering consciously. When you have a ability to understand that, it pains your heart in a very great sense of surge of empathy wells in your mind, and that itself completely excels all realization by that realization of the noble truth of suffering. You know. When you're able to do that, it's a melody because every single, uh, every single encounter, every single thing you witness the sufferings of others is not a story that you need to tell to make feel that you're helping them, but really the, when you see the sufferings of someone or that of yours, it actually echoes the very melody of experiences that you would have liked to go through in a deep meditation retreat. You know, what is so special about us having a wonderful two minutes experiences in a cave uh, that has nothing to do with the rest of your life's troubles, you know. You can tell stories, oh, I saw you were my mother in 20 lifetimes before, did you know that? And somebody say, yes, when did you know that? Oh, in my meditation. Who wouldn't believe that? You know, and, and that's a, that sort of thing. Most people get into the wrong spiritual tradition, <laughs> wrong spiritual materialism. They wanted to know, look, my meditation gave me this amazing knowledge <laughs> to grasp that I can recognize who you are, what I'll be in next life, that kind of amazing materialism, of spiritual materialism, becoming attached to such superficial <laughs> experiences. That's not melody at all. That's not spiritual melody at all. This is, that doesn't make sense. It makes sense to you, but it makes no noise, no sense to other people. They, say, they think you are weird, you know. Just live this life, will you, properly, instead of thinking about relationship 20 lifetimes before. Just treat me nicely this lifetime. Don't worry about past 20 lifetimes before. <laughs> people, people, would like, people would rather like you to be, if you have real spiritual realization, respect others. Have some courtesy of the needs and feelings of other people. That's more relevant than, than elevating someone because we think he's such and such is our past life or this, this, this. So it is important. Great melodious experience, spiritual meditators, they, it's, it, is a danger, it is very dangerous to tell what you see, what you feel in meditation, meditative experiences. It could be spiritual lies, they say. Spiritual lie is, a, is one of the five transgressions. Telling spiritual lies, although they may be true and you have that experience, but how, how much, how, how worthwhile it is to tell people how much benefit that, that we, can, we can cultivate by doing that. It's, it is important to therefore not fall into the trap of spiritual materialism by looking such experiences and visions and, and think that one is much a great meditator because you have some few, few flash-like flash experiences here and there. But if it's not relevant to make us a more saner, more kinder, more compassionate person in everyday life to others, we have got a long way to go. It's not a great meditator at all. Sure, you spend a lot of time in meditation, but you're completely trapped again in that now. You're attached to meditation. It's not a great meditator. Whereas great meditator is who, 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 has, who completely has control over their own thoughts, uh, not becoming completely at, trapped in one or the other. Because attachment, attachment, you know, is not that people don't do good, but they become attached to it, you see. So even if we meditate, but have become attached to meditation, one, one, one has this amazing sense of bias to meditation. And one has an amazing sense of sort of uh, um, apathy or, or some kind of aversion to things other than meditation. You know? When one becomes that, of course, one is in a point of really, uh, in a, that, that important junction to really try carefully and not to not to spoil it there and that you know that 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 junction of not knowing how to how to um, not knowing that non differentiation of between the two when one becomes so stuck in one thing of course it wouldn't be very 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 great an experiences so great melodious experience of meditation therefore comes to an individual will be understood by an individual who un who 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 could who not only have theoretical understanding of how one needs to uh, equip, equip oneself with all the six prerequisites of, of a meditation. Six prerequisites of meditation only gives you uh, the basis for the meditation, meditative experiences to occur. Yeah? And not everyone who goes in retreat with all those ideal circumstances can last long 
or can can come through with meditative experiences that are worthy of telling other people. They become trapped in certain spiritual materialism, as I said before. And uh, uh, so only few amongst those will be able to will be able to uh, deeply not only have experiences and the heightened experiences of the special inside of selflessness and how everything is a, if everything came in the mind and the world as a result of grasping to self not knowing what the self is and aversion to anything other than the self uh, anything other than the to be presumed to, to be other and grasping to uh, the self that is presumed to be self might not even be self there mightn't be a self let alone to presume one failing to discern that and becoming attached and trapped into notion of self and uh, of course unless one is able to transcend the duality of self and other there is no great uh, experience there is no great experience every experience is a dualistic every experience is otherwise dualistic if the experiences completely transcend the duality nullify the duality of all things then only it is a great meditation experiences and that's why the, when the words of the explanation on the great melody of experience uh, will be hard for people who have not understood the meaning of emptiness. This is what His Eminence uh, spoke to me um, on our way um, in a car. He says, oh, am, I t am I teaching the great melody of experience? He says, yes. Oh, really? He says, oh. How come I can teach that? He said, how can I teach that? Because this is all about emptiness. <laughs> this is all about emptiness. And if people aren't, aren't trained in the teachings of mind training and uh, preliminary teachings, this will not make sense to them. And he, 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 he seemed very concerned, you know, he seemed very concerned. I said, no, no, there's a lot of Dharma centers in Melbourne. All these people study Dharma with the different teachers and they read a lot of books and, and they have done all that. And, and he says, really, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, there are many songs of Trakpa Gyalza. He says, I could teach a shorter one, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> and and but but we we say oh we already translate into English you know <laughs> that's, a, that's a good excuse to get the teacher <laughs> oh, probably for his eminence that's a bit of a worry <laughs> of course he didn't say are you sure you've translated well <laughs> but I'm pretty sure. It's, as I said before at the very beginning, it's very difficult to get it exact in end by any linguist, however well trained. But the transmission, the direct transmission, just being the expression, just being the innocence, the purity, the pure vision in which His Eminence lives, I think that's a more of a melody that you can understand. The text is just a vehicle. <laughs> text is just a, just a railroad. <laughs> That is there all the time. The real carriage that you carry is through that railroad is the teacher. <laughs> is the teacher. So it's important to not get trapped into the word and 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 um, and paradoxical expressions of uh, Trakpa Gelsen, which uh, uh, I would not be in any way be able to ex explain or translate for his, even for his eminence. But direct transmission, I suppose, which is possible to be made by your own sense of receptivity. Your own reception has to be good enough for the transmission to occur. This is not your conceptual understanding of Buddhism or uh, any teaching that you have studied. Those are not the receptivity we're talking about. We're not talking of intellectual maturity. We're talking about spiritual maturity of faith and devotion, sense of pure, pure vision, with which we are all required to receive teachings from. Then the transmission, whether it's a sutric transmission, whereby you get the teachings, just a common dialogue, just, just like one way giving teachings, uh, or whether it's a form of uh, initiation ceremony, where the, the certain paraphernalia of refuges, a ritual is invoked and practices are done, music's played, various ritual symbols are, are displayed, and various activities are in, uh, invoked to facilitate the actual actual giving of the transmission. You know, we might invoke. But in the transmission of the uh, teachings, like the Buddha himself, often before he entered into the uh, commands giving sermon, Buddha never uh, th uh, thinks uh, that he's, he was teaching the five disciples. He, of course, those are the only visible five 
but they were more invisible beings whose sake he was giving the teachings off. That's why each time the Buddha spoke, uh, uh, however simple sermon it is, either to a one person coming with a, with a list of complaints about life's problem, or with a group of people, or a group of king that invites him to give teachings, he never s gave teachings exclusively, it's this for these people. He often says, I'm teaching in the language of the gods, and humans, and birds, and animals, and spirit, goblins, and, and demigods, and nagas, and yakshas, rakshas, all, all the lists of spirits world are listed as whom he is giving teachings. So that shows that we are not, that's why if that teacher actually approaches from that pure vision of giving a transmission to such a wide community of uh, not only those present here, that every sentient being virtually included, because at the very beginning when we recite uh, the prayer, we say, uh, I take refuge till enlightenment, and uh, by virtue of giving and the like, may I shall reach Buddhahood to aid all beings. So that is said at the very beginning. There's no point saying at the very beginning if you forget in the middle of the teachings. So that's why uh, the, the word, the traditional verse is either chanted or reflected upon as the teaching is given not only to the people present here, not only to the aptitude that we have now, but the aptitude of tomorrow, aptitude of weeks later, <laughs> so that the seed will will stay in us and will continue to germinate, one day that it will sh become a shoot. One day it might even grow in leaves and petals and fruits and, and what not. So we got to have such imagination. If we are able to cultivate the qualities of cupness, yeah, a cup that is free of three defects, that is not turned upside down, that is not leaking, and that is not you know, dirty itself. It's hard to be a good cup. <laughs> it may be very well painted from outside, like a beautiful china, you know. Oh, looks very freshly washed and bathed and come, it looks, had a good night's sleep and, you know, looks very good, uh, it looks very quiet, dead silence. It's very easy to, you know, display that receptivity, uh, quietness and, <laughs> and, and because we are all trained to study, you know, study from the early days of kindergarten, you know, it's a, the, the silence in the classes in the, in the Western academia is quite impressive. <laughs> you know, you can't get that in the Eastern, Eastern audiences, you know, a lot of noise. <laughs> But uh, I think that the, the three qualities of cupness, that's only the first of that. Just that kind of receptivity of the ordeal requirement, that's the most grossest level of requirement we can. We have many gadgets and very forms of communication to record every word that has been said. That's not the receptivity, that's not the transmission of the liking. <laughs> what, my lack, what may lack in receiving the transmission is faith and devotion. That's the, that's the, the defect, the, 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 the third defect of cup is dirty in itself, you know. There may be stains in the cup. It's put in the right, right way, you know. It, is, it looks very nice, and, but it may still have some stains from past, uh, you know, inside the cup that has been completely absentmindedly there. You know, no, nobody does it deliberately, by the way. <laughs> it is difficult to assume that pure vision and have so much trust and faith. We get caught up in words. We said, oh, he thought there were five, but he only said three. <laughs> we get caught up in things like that, you know. You know? And of course, with, with great beings like His Eminence, three doesn't mean three at all. Four doesn't mean four at all. These all the pages are usually jumbled up. In, and we try to correct him as not acceptable correction. It's a completely pure vision. <laughs> uh, the texts are there, you know. Texts are simply there. <laughs> His seminars, everything is pretty much spontaneous in itself, you know. Often all the pages are in the wrong order, anyway, all the time. Even right order is the wrong order, you know. <laughs> let alone, let alone <laughs> wrong order, you know. So it, it comes through that level, come, approaches from that level of transmission. <laughs> One needs to have that kind of level of vision and pure perception. When we are usually listening to, listening to teachings, we are only thinking how, whether it's made rational sense there and then or not. You know. You know, when you're going to that, you're, you're an intellectual listener. 
it's it's a, I'm 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 not against intellectualism by the way it's a, it's a quite helpful only if it if it if it cushioned <laughs> if it cushioned the rest of it but it shouldn't it, it is also important that it doesn't become a hindrance in itself because we have to be completely at the level of cup and you can't really pour into a cup if it's higher than the kettle cup has to be lower than the lower than the kettle <laughs> and it shouldn't be moving, shouldn't be, it should be still in there. So therefore the, the honor and respect that you have for the expounder of Dharma who teaches, who sits on a little bit higher on the, the higher than yourself, is not because of the prestige of the individual, but because of the honor and respect of Dharma. We always visualize lion throne, cross vajra. Can you see the cross vajra here? Cross vajra. Yeah, this is the this is the symbol of the uh, seat of the Buddha, who said in Buddha Gaya of uh, what is called diamond seat. Diamond seat means uh, you know, promise not to move and stay still until reaching enlightenment. So all the disciples of the Buddha who uphold the Dharma have such a I would say promise and pledge has made uh, like an indestructible pledge for the Dharma. And with that strong courage and determination, they give the teaching. So a heightened form of the throne is therefore dignity of dharma, not of the individual. And not of the individual. If you're bowing down to the teacher, you think you're bowing down to this person who have you just met, and you don't feel proper to be doing so, because you're, it's not in our nature to bow down to anybody. Uh, but all of a sudden, we feel that you have to. You're not bowing down to anybody other than the exalted enlightened ones. That might be yourself. In this case, you have to do it in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Lord, later on, the one who bow down more humbly and respectfully to others have a lot of respect, self-respect. Self, you know, being able to care on well-being much handsomely than one may have done in the past. So bowing down is not some kind of service or some kind of uh, um, uh, favor to the teacher. Probably teacher, usually, of course, his eminence would not feel the way where other teachers feel. Other teachers feel when people bow down, they really wish they don't have to receive all this bow down because they feel completely overwhelmed uh, by the sheer attention it draws. You know, it's very difficult to be, received, to be a recipient of bows than one who bows. <laughs> Receiving the bows of other people is an amazing responsibility. You have to assume the divine pride of being no less than the Buddha himself to be worthy of receiving the bows of others. Imagine that courage. Imagine that sense of, sense of certitude <laughs> uh, to stay in the seat of the Dharma, throne of the Dharma, and expound the melodious sounds of the Dharma like the roaring sound of the lion. Little do people have such courage to expound the truth. They may be able to do so in their fields of special specialty, but not in doing so in the, in, the, uh, in the expounding of the Dharma. So that's why the transmission must be coming. Transmission comes not because how good the transmitter is, but how good the recipient receiver is. How well tuned our radio station is how well tuned our mind is to be, to be able to receive the particular wavelength of the teaching that is transmitted, you know. And, and that's why it is important that there are many different levels. Even in the initiation, there are many different levels or signs of the reception, reception of the blessings of the dissension of the transcendental wisdom. Physical sign of dissension of transcendental wisdom can cause shaking in the body, in a gross physical body. And subtle level, it completely blesses the body. Some people may be, have completely cured of the illness during initiation by sheer attendance with a pure sense of receptivity physically. They may not have felt then and there, but it, they soon will. Verbally, they, they, by during the dissension of transcendental wisdom of the initiation, they may be able to they may be able to uh, govern all audial energy of other people much more handsomely. They're not easily troubled by people's verbal abuse anymore. It's just another echo of the mantra. And because of that, you are, you, you are able to use the mantra not only 21 times each day as a minimum commitment or fulfillment of commitment, but as a result of that recitation, it has equipped your mind so much so to hear all uh, sounds made by nature and people as an echo of the mantra of your own mind. 
When you're able to do that, then you've got a transmission much greater than the mere verbal recitation it required of you each day. Yeah. During the recitation, during the transmission of the transcendental wisdom of the mind, transmission, of course, is that, that it could completely bless your mind stream. You never knew that your mind could be transformed. How can you go and do something where your mind is transformed? You know? I mean, you can go and sit in, in I, uh, I'm, I'm not against hairdo, hairdos, but you know, sit, in the, sit in the barber shop under this very, uh, those big, how do you call it, this plastic, isn't it? I mean, sit there, it's a wonderful, hoping something wonderful will transform you, you know. Sit there two hours, three hours, a strange person doing so many things on your hair, and you come out, look in the mirror, oh, I'm happy. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we even worship those superficial transformation. We're talking about a much deeper transformation. You know, we're not talking about visual transformation. We're talking about a, a transformation of how we think, a way that that we never know how to think otherwise that we never know to how to have those thoughts that we don't normally like. Just imagine that can happen as a blessing of a transmission of no ordinary person, but a really, really exalted, special being. You don't need to ask many questions. Just being there tells you that you are in the right place. You could not think of anyone else. When you have that, you are, you are receptive to receive the transmission of the mind, <laughs> mind transmission. Some people may do various things to one mind transmission one by one, but uh, if you are pure and sincere enough, it can happen in a huge group as well. It mightn't require a lot of long teachings. It mightn't require long teachings on any particular subject. It might happen in an instant. It required it happened with many disciples of the Buddha. First sermon was enough for the Kaudyanya, the first elder, elder of the five members. After a couple of, couple of sort of sentences of Four Noble Truth, it happened all there. He was already enlightened as Arhat. <laughs> Within the first sermon, the beginning part of the sermon, he already achieved. Because the transmission was happening. Amazing, you know. The amazing, the, 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 the synchronicity of having the right teacher, the right motivation, and the right time, and you happen to be there. You know, what you call perfection of all five factors. I mean, you, you can have yourself all the time, but never the right teacher. Never the teacher who has the realization. Sure, there are a lot of teachers who have an intellectual realization, but not deep experience that is transferable. The intellectual knowledge just simply gives them an ego with their knowledge, but they don't have the compassion. They don't have the wisdom. They don't have the commitment to practice it day and night, whether they're strong or weak or they're there or here, whether they're traveling or not. His eminence actually regards himself always in retreat. He keeps saying, oh, I shouldn't be here. I'm in retreat. And he said, did you know what I have to do to come to Australia? I said, no. He said, I had to do a fire puja to give me the permission to come here. I'm still in retreat. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so in many ways, his eminence is constantly in a retreat in that state of vision. It doesn't stop him from traveling. But of course, he, 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 he senses that his activities of being with people is a greater cause of happiness for the future, more than what the people at the present can uh, begin to realize. Of course, we have great gratitude and happiness being there. Each and every one of us feel the level that we can feel most. Uh, but, but the long-term benefit of such transmission is quite an unimaginable one. The ripple effect we talk about, ripple effect. Of, uh, of His Eminence being born in a Kushang family some 82 years ago. Had nothing to do with us. We never thought we'll meet here in Holy Redeemer Hall. <laughs> what are we redeeming? <laughs> 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 Let's do something from this. <laughs> 
Amazing, amazing correspondence there, you know. <laughs> there must be something in the air that happened many, many years or lives ago that we can come and be in the presence of His Eminence to receive this transmission. So in that sense, we need to cultivate that kind of joy and to allay the possible defects of the third kind of the cup. If you have faith and pure vision, none of the defects of the third kind can come in your mind. You don't know how to feel tired, you don't know how to feel thirsty, you don't know how to feel anything. You feel completely captivated by the sense of being in the presence of enlightened one, the pure vision of your own. It will be an amazing meditative experience of its own kind. It's not repeatable unless one does it there and then. So that's why it, it, that, 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 that sense of quality needs to be cultivated in receiving the transmission. His eminence, of course, background you are, uh, very much is, has been circulated in literature, but very much a historical background of person is quite, you can really write a list of somebody who did what. You know? you, have you seen those curriculum vita vita of people? You know, very long list of things, what they did and what they become, what they currently are. Uh, looks impressive on the paper, <laughs> but what they like to be with. How are they really kind? Are they really compassionate? Are they really patient? Are they really giver? It's a quite a different kind, you know. The, the qualities of like like the qualities of enlightened being is three, really basically wisdom, compassion and power. Power is to influence others, totally changing people, you know. And, and we have no way, how, no way of knowing how, how the teaching changes us through a medium of a particular person. Because the teaching, the power of the teaching is inherited in the mind stream of the person or the lineage of the tradition and he or she is able to transmit that. Only in the minds of the receptive one, not to everyone unfortunately, except if they are all receptive, which is possible. So the power, the, power, the quality of power is where we completely change our mind, may allay all fears and inconsistency of our mind because we are able to give ourselves the fullest receptivity that we can possibly do. And that power we cannot know straight away. But something definitely is empowering you to be able to do that. Maybe you are only designed to sit, you are only used to sitting 45 minutes lectures. You know, beyond that, all of a sudden, you have to look, is it your wrist? What's the time? Is, isn't he supposed to talk on the subject? No. He's still ringing the bell, doing his prayers. <laughs> you see? So the, the, the whole idea of, idea of quality of compassion is that, you know, you, you, is like his eminence actually doesn't need those ritual preparations. <laughs> but he does the preparation in the presence of everyone. And, and, um, and uh, that preparation itself is try to adhere to the scriptures as, as faithfully as possible. Yeah? So that he doesn't bring dishonor to the lineage and tradition in which he was raised. So he therefore tried to, as, as faithfully as possible, time isn't a concern for his eminence, uh, because <laughs> he, he, he doesn't know when is when. He doesn't know whether it's a train or an aircraft. When, he, when we are in aircraft, he says, is this train going to leave? <laughs> we already did three hours in the flight, but he says, is this train going to move? I said, I hope so, Rinpoche. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say it quite like that. <laughs> I said, this is a train in the air. <laughs> this is a train in the air. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a completely pure vision. It you know? doesn't really know what is, doesn't really need to know where is where and when is when. It's only in the trouble, you know, people who are troubled with a lot of concepts. <laughs> One who is pure <laughs> doesn't, it's a completely different being, you know. And the one who has an amazing sense of welfare of the beings, compassion, uh, and so uh, the mind is not mind doesn't see those small minor things, you know. There was a teaching uh, uh, by uh, by a teacher in uh, many many years ago, and he was uh, giving teachings, and of course Tibetan teachings are never said when will it end. <laughs> 
they barely say when it will begin. <laughs> we just try to put something on the paper just so as to and attract the people. <laughs> but otherwise, <laughs> and and this teacher went on teaching and. And uh, one, um, one very busy housewife attended the teaching because she saw everybody going. She thought, I might as well go. What's, what's happening in there? She went. She had cows to milk and all the sorts of things and household duties, but she went in there. And as uh, she attended the first part of teaching, it all made sense and, and she was very happy. You know? and she thought she couldn't have gone anywhere but here. Later on, you know, it, the sun was setting. It's getting a bit cold. And the teacher just went on and on and on. Then she, uh, previously in the f first few hours, it was very fond of, she felt great. This is a wonderful teacher. He's so great. She had all this pure admira admiration to the teacher. All of a sudden, she was good, becoming very concerned about her time. All of a sudden, she started having a version about the teacher's look and everything, you know. You know? <laughs> She even talked to herself, saying, oh, that, that bald-headed old man, you know, he doesn't look at time, you know, I have cows to milk and, and uh, <laughs> do all the domestic, uh, and it's going to be dark, and how will I find my way down the hill? It was quite a, no, no, there wasn't a real road, but a small footpath on the hill. And she was all concerned about herself, you know, all concerned about her, her, her evening and her cow. <laughs> That's the third defect came to her. Third defects of the cup came and towards the end of the session. Not at the beginning. <laughs> towards the end of the session. And she was very restless. And teacher knew. The teacher knew exactly the lady was thinking that. And he was saying, you can milk a cow rest of your life if that is going to do <laughs> and of course, she never knew it was. Of course, it was teaching to everybody, but she it came straight to her. It completely changed her, trans, changed her vision, her, her perception. That's right. And how many cows I want to milk anyway? <laughs> to make me feel, oh, I milk my cow, so I'm happy. It was a distraction to her. It's just she didn't know, she wasn't conscious enough to think like that and she, instead the teaching became a distraction. The time became a distraction to her, the cow became her meditation. <laughs> exactly the role reversal. <laughs> reversal. So that's the third defect of the cup, is whereby some kind of unhelpful thought comes in, it takes over you and all of a sudden you don't, you don't uh, make uh, the best of the time. Uh, that you are at the, at the situation. This definitely can happen you know, if one one's mindful. That's the one defect, one hindrance in being uh, in um, becoming a receptive cup is uh, is that defects can come in no time. It looks like very realistic reminder. Yeah, it's the right time to milk my cow. Yes, amazing mindfulness, isn't it? <laughs> uh. But so what? If you are the one who has to milk, if you decide not to milk, it's so much the better. Maybe the cow will be relieved that you're not pulling her udder. <laughs> when, when one is able to think very, very constructively, of course the, 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 the visions could be completely changed. So it is, it is important in receiving the transmission of uh, the great melody of experience that, uh, that His Eminence will give. Uh, is a, it's a very, it's quite not a short text uh, that can be just briefed through quickly because each word, each verse is different. And, um, and the translation of this will be provided later this afternoon as His Eminence comes. But of course His Eminence will teach through the text. And um, I would like you to... to um, receive it in a completely different level uh, than you would in other, in other lectures and, and teachings uh, because of the nature, uh, nature of the teaching and the person who's delivering it. And uh, I, could do no, uh, I could do no help in being a translator. Uh, um, it, it simply is a routine that I appear to be translating, but, it's, but you got to translate much more handsomely <laughs> than I could possibly do linguistically. Um, so I, I, it is a difficult task, uh, even to say we have got the translation. 
You can't translate truth. It has to be experienced. But we, but I, but we, we, I wouldn't say, oh, <laughs> let's the direct transmission go <laughs> and not translate at all. Uh, it will probably require, uh, the, the ritual of translation may require, <laughs> may require as a, as a facilitator, but of course it shouldn't be, uh, if, uh, it, it, it needn't be an obstacle in receiving direct transmission that might be more, I would say, pertinent from the teachings than the actual wording of the things you will hear. So, I would, uh, I would uh, like to believe that uh, we have a break now <laughs> and have maybe a, a lunch and a uh, quarter hours of break, then this will be just right time uh, to invite His Eminence here around two o'clock and uh, then the teaching will begin. And it's very possible His Eminence may stay on after the teaching, uh, rest of the evening, early part of the evening, do uh, puja, the Mahakala puja. Sometimes he say he wanted to do straight away after the teaching, so he might do here. So you're all welcome to stay on and, and participate if you have the time. And, uh, or His Eminence may, may instead go uh, leave here and do the puja, the puja where he's res residing. So, um, <clears throat> so this can very well happen. So now we will conclude with the dedication of merit. <coughs> Do you have any announcement? After after the dedication, okay. <coughs> Yeah. 